So what? What? So I run a I run a clinic at the Rotunda every Wednesday afternoon um, on infections and in pregnancy, and my first love really is infections and in pregnancy. And I'll discuss that a little bit as this pre presentation goes on, and I'll present some of the information that we have on congenital infections and in pregnancy. That's right. Uh, this is the Rotunda, and we have a clinic called the Dove Clinic that was set up in the days of the injecting drug use epidemic in Ireland. So lots of women who are on opiate substitution therapy. And Dove sounds beautiful, but Dove stands for danger of viral exposure. So there you go. So that's our clinic. And we run it every Wednesday. And Ireland was one of the lead countries in actually doing automatic testing of all, H of all pregnant women for HIV. And it's only by doing that, identifying these women, that we've been able to start them on treatment and eliminate hep HIV from mother to child transmission. So, 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 so uh, good to Ireland. Um, talking about uh, maternal infections, when do infections transmit from mother to child? And I'm gonna be talking about other diseases first and then at the end, discussing some of the limited information we have on Borreliosis. Um, so it can happen in utero, it can happen at the time of delivery, and it can happen postpartum through breastfeeding. So herpes is an example of, a bit of an infection that happens at the time of delivery, mucosal, mucosal contact, not in utero. Um, and then there's a number of infections that can occur through breastfeeding. And then how does the infection spread from mother to child? Either by contiguous spread, local spread, or through the bloodstream, okay? Very simple. So every infection, every congenital infection that spreads from mother to child um, occurs at this time or in this route. And then I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on this slide, but what are the effects of the maternal infection on the fetus and newborn? There can be lots of effects depending upon whether it's placental insufficiency if there's not a good blood supply getting to the baby, there can be lots of complications. There can be complications from the infection crossing the placenta early in development and causing lots of damage. And then if, it, if the transmission occurs late in pregnancy, after all of the organs are formed, as you know, organogenesis occurs within eight weeks. Neural tube closure actually is within 21 days of con conception. Um, it, it, there's lots of different complications, but the point is, if a mother's infected, it can have an effect on the baby, either indirectly or directly from transmission of the, that pathogen to the baby. So low birth weight, preterm birth, abortion and stillbirth, developmental abnormalities, congenital diseases, postnatal persistence of infections, so sometimes you can be infected at birth. Tuberculosis is an example. Congenital tuberculosis, the baby, if you don't know the mom is TB, um, the baby can show up a year of life very unwell and actually die. Not necessarily pulmonary TB, but actually disseminated tuberculosis, um, peritonitis, other complications. So we have a good understanding of most of these infections because they've been resourced and well studied. Uh, we used to talk about TORCH, T-O-R-C-H. If you look at the classic textbooks, toxoplasmosis, other infections, and that included syphilis, and I think we j I just threw in Borrelia there. Um, rubella, CMV, and herpes. So these are the classic TORCH infections, and just using one of them as an example, CMV. If you're infected early on in utero, you have a very poor immune system, you, you haven't developed your organs, you come out very sick. So this is an example of a baby um, that was infected early with CMV, anemia, leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, and some of these babies die. So there's a high mortality. Um, but some children are infected with CMV later, and they may be asymptomatic at birth, but then it doesn't matter if it's congenital or, they're infected from mother to child, and then that virus starts doing damage slowly at the time of delivery or after that, and then there's complications. Chorioretinitis, 
sensory neural hearing loss, uh, and then other problems later on, okay? And this is, and they're asymptomatic, but they're not really asymptomatic. These babies have been prospectively followed up, and there's complications from ongoing viral infection in these babies, okay? Syphilis, another example. Um, we know how it's transmitted. Um, you know, so vertical transmission is what we're focusing on, mother-to-child transmission of syphilis. We've only had one case of syphilis where the baby was very sick here uh, at the rotunda, and it was an 18-week pregnant Malawian lady showed up with twins. Um, I think she delivered at 24 weeks. Uh, one baby was dead with hydrops. The other baby survived with a, and had a rash. The rash was syphilis, the rash was HIV. And on the examination of the placenta, um, riddled with syphilis. So this was an example of what, oh, oh, that then we tested the mother, positive for HIV, positive for syphilis, tested the father, positive for HIV, positive for syphilis. And then I just saw the father a year ago in the hospital here because he defaulted from care and he showed up with hepatitis and pneumocystis and when we buy up the, the liver, there were granuloma that grew out tuberculosis. So, um, so this is syphilis. Um, and we understand a lot about syphilis because it's been well studied. There's a process of attachment. We understand the immune system of syphilis and, this, and the immune system in pregnancy. Uh, what happens in terms of the clearance of syphilis and some host immunity uh, that develops in response to community of syphilis. So syphilis has been well studied. And I gave you an example of a child who was infected early in utero, the Malawian mother who delivered a baby who, had, who died of hydrops. Um, so you can be symptomatic early on, but if you're infected later, you may not become symptomatic till after birth. And I've had cases after cases, especially with HIV and syphilis, where the mother delivered and the baby was symptomatic within a week or two after birth, that I've had babies who didn't develop symptoms till years after birth. So, so there's a whole spectrum of diseases depending on the time of transmission and also depending upon the host of, of the mother, whether the mother was HIV positive or HIV negative. And these are some of the complications of syphilis that we won't go into. My favorite topic is mother-to-child transmission of HIV, because I was, I, was, I was in America early on when, when nobody cared about HIV, because it was in the inner city of Baltimore or the inner city of New York, here, there, and everywhere. And there was these drug-using mothers who had babies that were basically orphans in the New York Children's Hospital. But we've gone from HIV infection in children and advocacy dealing with children with AIDS to a plan for elimination of mother-to-child transmission of HIV. And it's a very interesting story. Um, so, so we had early on cases of HIV in adults, and then there was a case in New England Journal of Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome in infants, and then there was this whole scandal of HIV, people deserving to have HIV, and advocacy gay men originally, but then children, providing advocacy for HIV. And this is actually the first case of a, ch of a child with HIV ever in a Boston Children's Hospital. So it was a two-year-old child who was infected. We didn't have the antibody test to HIV till 1984. So we didn't know exactly what they had at this stage. But this child had all these problems. Unexplained illness. So what did people do? They investigated it. So this is just, and, and this child had all these immunological abnormalities. And finally, you know, you know complications, uh, malnutrition, thrush, developmental delay, all these symptoms related to that, okay? And then the child died. And what did the child have at autopsy? Lots of complications, immunological and infectious complications of an underlying immunodeficiency. HIV gets into your lymphocytes. If your lymphocytes don't work, this is, this is the end result, okay? 
So this was one of the first pediatric cases described. And um, this is a slide that, from Newsweek talking about kids with AIDS. And then they said one in four infants are infected, but they didn't know when and how the transmission occurs. So what happened based on that one case, based on these four children that they had uh, originally in New Jersey, they actually did studies. And then they found out that from a study by Bryson et al. from UCLA, that if you drew cord blood on a baby at birth, and it was positive, the baby was infected in the womb, and if the cord blood was negative at birth, and was positive after 72 hours, then the baby was infected as it came down the birth canal from mucosal inf infection. And then they did studies in Johns Hopkins, uh, a group by Brooke Jackson, the pathologist there in Uganda. Not very ethical studies. They actually watched the mother, HIV positive mothers, breastfeed the babies. And then each month that they breastfeed, there was a 0.4 increase in transmission. So there was a 25% transmission from in utero in interpartum, an additional 15% transmission from postpartum through breastfeeding. Uh, so this was work done by Laura Gay, Ga who was in Uganda, um, uh, Mary Glenn Fowler, who was at the NIH. But they resourced and they investigated, and we understood everything about HIV. And then there was politics. There was Ryan White, who was the first hemophiliac that stood up in Congress and said, it's not just gay men and drug users that get HIV. Look at me, I'm a white boy, you know. Uh, but there was prejudice. And there was kids in Florida who are banned from school for having HIV. And then finally they got back into the school and somebody burned down their home. This is Florida. So there's been huge prejudice that we've had to overcome. But science and advocacy got us to somewhere with HIV. Um, this made a big difference. And then we did the first study on HIV, AZT or placebo, to see if it worked. And then we discovered that if you had an undetectable viral load in the mother at delivery, that means there's an undetectable viral load in the mucosa. So when the baby comes through the birth canal, the baby doesn't get HIV. It's not rocket science, but it took the NIH, the NICHD, the NIAID resources and, and investment to get these problems solved. And that was my, my study was ACDG 185 that I worked with in 1999. And it showed that if you had an undetectable viral load, that there was no transmission to baby. And based on that, we treat tri pregnant women with triple therapy and we shouldn't have any new infected babies if we diagnose them. So can we get a cure for HIV and, and AIDS and mother to child? We're on the way, but there's been a 70% decrease. We're still not detecting. We're still missing people. But these are success stories based on science, investment and in research, and advocacy. All right, so, so this is just, a, a, before we move on to Borrelia burgdorferi, um, this is, this is a, 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 an article by Larson et al. JID. And they just talk, and they've actually they actually present a murine model, um, and in this publication, complications of preg pregnancy and transplacental transmission of relapsing fever, Borreliosis. They kind of give a background. So Borrelia has been studied in the third world, relapsing fever, and Borrelia duttoni is a common cause of complications of pregnancy, miscarriage, and neonatal death in sub-Saharan Africa. And there's lots of publications on this. Up to 6.4% of pregnant women in the Democratic Republic of Congo had a diagnosis of, of, of relapsing fever with complications of low birth weight, preterm delivery, spontaneous abortion, and neonatal death. And interestingly, when they did a murine model study, they actually said that if you're pregnant, you have a lower load of Borrelia than a not pregnant. So pregnancy somehow lowers the amount of bacteria uh, that you have in this model than after you deliver. If, so pregnant versus non-pregnant mice. The pregnant mice had lower amounts of Borrelia. The non-pregnant mice had higher amounts, okay? What do we know about Borrelia and pregnancy? The women tend to be 
less symptomatic in pregnancy. So, so there's lots of data out there that has, provides useful information. So in this Murain model, they did, did, like I said, they demonstrated intrauterine growth retardation, placenta damage, inflammation, impaired fetal and placental circulation, and decreased hemoglobin levels. Um, that the organism can traverse the maternal fetal barrier, causing congenital infection. They, like I said, they observed a correlation between spirochete exposure and low gestational weight. Inflammation of the placenta, RBC depletion, hemorrhaging resulting in nutrient and oxygen depletion to the fetus. So some of it's placental insufficiency, lack of nutrients going to the mother-child unit. Some of it is the infection crossing over. Some of the higher amounts of spirochetes do more damage than lower amounts of spirochetes. No different than on any other infection. But, but we, need to, we need to learn from these studies. Um, so when they actually did pathology studies, congenital infection was confirmed by microscopy. Um, they found the organism in placenta, and there was transplacental transmission in up to 72%. As mentioned, 12.5-fold decrease in spirochete burden in pregnant versus non-pregnant, and they've th they're pursuing those studies. Why? And they think it's due to TH2 shift related to hormonal fluctuations. So the bacteria spreads to and damage the maternal fetal unit, higher bacterial load is bad, and earlier gestational infection is bad. No different than, than syphilis, no different than other infections we understand. What's in the literature? In our textbooks on congenital borreliosis, infants can be infected with Borrelia, transplacenta in any stage of pregnancy and or via breast milk and there's other co-infections that they talk about, but not well described, that can tr transmit from mother to child. Babesia, Bartonella, Mycoplasma, Ehrlichias. Also, just in the general literature, gestational borreliosis can be associated with, with repeated miscarriages, fetal death, fetal death at term, stillbirths, hydrocephalus, a number of abnormalities, IUGR, respiratory distress, sepsis, hyperbilirubinemia, cortical blindness, SIDS, and maternal toxemia of pregnancy. Another review. Borrelia spirochetes have been found at autopsy in fetal brain, liver, adrenal glands, spleen, bone, marrow, heart, and placenta. Interestingly, none of the infected tissues showed any sign of inflammation. But what does that mean? If you're pregnant, you're, you know, in pregnancy, you're less likely to generate an inflammatory response. People are using this to say it's not relevant if you don't demonstrate an inflammatory response, and I would question that. Some studies have shown that maternal antibody treatment during pregnancy doesn't guarantee the fetus will be free of infection, but it does lessen the risk of complications, so antibiotics make a difference in terms of the outcome to the baby, and then we won't talk about recommendations, but they vary. Obviously, you avoid doxycycline in pregnancy and amoxicillin for longer periods of time, but not good literature or good recommendations on what you should do. This is a case from Schlesinger et al. in the American, uh, the, the American um, Medicine Journal, gone back, way back to 1985, the time, same time period that HIV was being described. Look what we've got with HIV. How far have we got with Lyme? Not very far. But this describes a, a, a woman who developed Lyme in the first trimester. She had the rash, didn't receive treatment, and the baby was born at 35 weeks gestation, died of congenital cardiac disease, respiratory symptoms, valvular lesions. The pathology revealed Lyme disease spirochetes in the spleen, kidney, bone marrow, but not in the heart. No evidence of inflammation. Five days postpartum, the mother flared up. It was arthritis, was tested positive for Lyme, and then received antibiotics. So the question was, is there a teratogenetic effect of Lyme? Possibly. We don't know. Should be studied further. Uh, this is another presentation on obstetrics gynecology survey, 2006. A 42-year-old woman, 34 weeks gestation, who presented with left knee pain. She's from New York City. She hadn't been out of the city for a year but previous year in the Hamptons and Long Island, and she'd actually had some knee pain 
um, previously. Um, so maybe she was infected previously and reactivated in the setting of pregnancy, we don't know. But they stuck a needle in the knee, isolated 44,000 bacteria, no organisms. She was Lyme antibody positive. She was given oral amoxicillin. Uh, a week later, the knee was swollen again. Uh, she didn't re respond to the antibiotics. She was culture negative. The baby actually turned out okay. The placenta was fine. But one week postpartum, she, the knee flared up again. And she, she was actually had a needle stuck in to the knee. And it was PCR positive for Borrelia. Um, she was given an additional two weeks of amoxicillin. So standard treatment doesn't always cure. And this could have been missed uh, potentially. Um, if people hadn't pursued this uh, further. So probably the most important study is the study by McDonald um, on gestational Lyme borreliosis uh, from the rheumato rheumatological disease clinics of North America in 1989. And he was, he was a pathologist down in Southampton, Long Island, Lyme endemic area. And, and, and he did a retrospective study of 19 cases of clinically active Lyme disease in pregnant women who were actually part of a study. So they actually had really good uh, monitoring of these women and well-described Lyme disease clinically and otherwise, 17 women with EM, uh, uh, the, the erythema migrans rash, one with a facial palsy arthritis and one with arthritis and positive antibody. And he went back to the pathology specimens, and what did they find in these babies who had died? Um, fetal death, hydrocephalus, cardiovascular abnormalities, neonatal respiratory distress, hyperbilirubinemia, IUGR, cortical blindness, SIDS, maternal tuxemia in pregnancy. And then when they looked at the pathological specimens, this is a few years ago, they, they, were, they, were, they saw spirochetes. Spirochetes were in the organism. So the mother had Lyme, the babies died, Spirochetes were uh, identified in the tissues. Um, so, impressive. Let's do a prospective study and test 5,000. Not just, you know, start following all pregnant women who get Lyme in pregnancy. This would be the next logical uh, move from 1989. Lyme disease during pregnancy, a study from JAMA. Um, they went back and identified 19 cases of congenital Lyme disease, eight in the first trimester, seven in the second trimester, two in the third trimester, 13 received appropriate antibody therapy. Of the 19 pregnancies in this, five had adverse outcomes, including syndactyly, cortical blindness, intrauterine fetal death, prematurity, and rash. So, logical conclusion, the frequency of such outcomes warrants further surveillance and studies of pregnant women with Lyme disease. This is 1986. So what's been done? A review in 2018 from north of the border in, in America. What's that country just north of the United States? Oh, Canada, that's right. Uh, yeah, I get it out of here. Um, but anyway, so I think this lady, Lisa Waddell, did a systematic review to summarize the global literature of adverse birth outcomes associated with gestational Lyme disease in humans. She identified 45 studies, 29 describing 59 cases. Adverse outcomes included spontaneous miscarriage, newborn death, newborns with abnormal outcomes. Only one case provided some evidence of vertical transmission of Borrelia that had negative consequences for the fetus. Hmm, she must have done a PubMed search Different from me, I'm sorry. Um, so, so, geez, so they, they must be that cold weather up north of the border in Canada. Um, and maybe she's not a clinician. She also reviewed epidemiological studies and said there was no difference. But they tested, do you, pregnant women, did you have a tick bite? And they did a comparison of those who did and didn't. Did you have an antibody test positive, yes, no? So that's not the way to do an epidemiological study. She did a meta-analysis of nine studies showing significantly higher adverse outcomes in women reported to have been treated with gestational Lyme compared to those treated in pregnancy. And then the global evidence does not fully characterize the potential impact of gestational Lyme disease and future research, which hasn't been done since 1986, um, should be done to address our knowledge gaps. 
So these authors downplay the risk of early infection, late infection, the role of maternal and fetal factors. Um, there's evidence that Lyme transmits in pregnancy through breast milk. So in conclusion, or my summary, does Lyme spread from mother to child? There is good evidence, guys, there really is. And we can keep on saying it should be researched. And we don't know, we do know. We successfully answered the question with HIV. It is transmitted. We only have small studies, but they're convincing. It's likely that early in utero infection causes more severe damage, placental insufficiency, large volume bacteremia. Lack of inflammation doesn't mean the baby isn't infected. You know, probably be more inflammation if it's early in utero. Um, inflammation may come later. And having an ICD-11 code for congenital Lyme would facilitate recognition and better prospective studies and encourage future research. And my concern is that this information from this Waddell study has been used to actually raise the question whether there's such a thing as congenital Lyme. Uh, and it was a crap review. So what are the next steps? We need to stop downplaying the extent of Borrelia infections worldwide. There's no doubt that Lyme, Borrelia infections, and others spread from pregnant women to their unborn child. And we can learn from other diseases. Prospective studies are needed. Of course, better knowledge of the factors involved need to be understood, but the question is, we always ask, why is Lyme disease blocked? So what studies are needed? We need to do prospective studies. We need quantitative measures of spirochetemia in different trimesters and measurement about birth outcomes. We need studies of placenta pathology. We need to characterize early birth postpartum infection, and we need to prospectively follow babies born to these mothers to see short-term and long-term outcomes. We did it for HIV. We've done it for syphilis, CMV. Um, you know, Borreliosis should be no different. Thank you. Okay. What time is it? Okay, so, so Jenna? You're chairing, it's your, your, your decision. Um, Bet Lloyd from Canada. I apologize on behalf of Canada. <laughs> I, I have to say, you, you made my day, possibly year, with your comments on the Waddell review. The initial, just for some backstory, the initial review uh, draft of that said that there was no evidence categorically for either transmission or negative outcome. The fact that we got as far as we did was because of a group of advocates, clinicians, and researchers actually read the papers that they hadn't and pointed that out. I read them too. Yeah. Um, yes, the authors had not and still have not. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. I was happy to hear it because, of course, in the history of syphilis, it was uh, told that in the press medical at that time that uh, syphilis uh, is able to be transmitted for four generations. Uh, I think uh, this is an important question, and I think it's something very important to follow. Uh, and just a small uh, uh, notice that uh, my daughter uh, delivered one year ago a triple and uh, about four years before term she was able everything went well of course I was a little bit afraid because the complications are always higher and she developed um, hypertension uh, which is one of the signs of uh, um, the complication that we have uh, in uh, uh, in such situation, of course, what's happened that they told it uh, the hypertension and a leukocytury urea in the in uh, was was uh, developed, but the, there was not a 
fortunately, and the protein was not very much available. And after after um, delivery, she had against the uh, hypertension, and they have given to her uh, uh, two different antihypertensive, uh, very big dose, doses. And I told to her that uh, after, I, unfortunately, I was her her physician, and I was able to do what what I felt the best. And what's happened that um, I have given to her coamoxicillin for one month, and uh, we uh, uh, diminished the uh, antihypertensive agent. And when she went back for a control. Everything was absolutely right. So um, what I was thought about that, my God, uh, because of course during uh, during uh, pregnancy the the kidneys are are compressed. Uh, if there is a leukocyturia, uh, of course this is, it can be a sign also of a, an infection uh, or, or inflammation. So I was thought about all the others uh, that uh, if uh, they are getting uh, so very strong antihypertensive therapy, the the kidney will be able less uh, uh, have will have less uh, possibility to recover. So it's very important what you are doing, and and I think um, that it's the right way. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm Anne Cruikshank. I'm a GP from England. Um, it just occurs to me that if we were trying to get any data on pregnant women, we almost need to... The push needs to come from the patient community, whereby if the patient groups are aware of, of this issue, um, then patients could potentially push maybe for cordial bloods to be taken and testing done uh, at the end of a pregnancy and anybody who was diagnosed either pre-pregnancy uh, or during pregnancy. I, I agree, Anne, but that, that's an important concept. But when, I, when I was a junior doctor at going to the AIDS clinical trial group meetings, nobody was interested in mother to child transmission. And I was at a meeting in Bethesda, and I jumped on the subway from Bethesda and went up to NICHD and said, can I talk to the director? Because I wanted to do a study on mother to child transmission. And they, the associate director met with me, and they resourced that study. Lynn Moffison was the medical officer at the National Institute of Child Health and Development for the study that we developed. So sometimes you need to be a bit ballsy and take the initiative and with good ideas and get the right people on board. So there's, there's, there's lots of different ways to make these things happen. Patients are important, but money talk and having the scientific community behind you or at least entertaining you as, as a plausible, you know, scientific cause, I think is equally important as well. Mm -hmm. But you need money, and everybody in this room who's doing research is doing it on a shoestring. Um, Tony Fauci at the NIH has 1.7 billion in NIAID just for HIV alone. You know, Jesus, you know, mm -hmm. amazing, you know. And HIV, we've got it 90% solved. So we, we need to get some of those monies on board, so I think that's critical as well. Okay. So I think one more question and we'll move on. Uh, just quickly, um, as a fantastic analogy between HIV and Lyme, um, are you saying Lyme is H HIV back to 1980s? Are you, well, is there any correlation between I, th those? I think some of the, the, the same journey that HIV went through, Lyme is going through. All right, okay. Same journey. Thank you. I'm Monica Wilder, herbalist working in Scotland. Um, a year ago, I went to a Lyme um, training day with an American pediatrician whose name I can't remember at the moment, but I can look her up. And um, she had had Lyme herself and then had a child who'd later developed, you know, Lyme um, quite early on. And she had been working with people and was convinced that, um, you know, maternal transmission was a, was a fact. 
um, but that in a lot of infants it was dormant until a, um, you know, an immune crisis stimulated it or activated it. And um, she said that she felt very much from her own experience in cases that quite often it was dormant until immunization and the challenges of immunization um, could set it off. I don't know if you have an opinion on that. Well, I, I, you know, I think this is the second hit by thought, hypothesis. You have a dormant infection and something else hits you. It doesn't matter if it's a monoclonal antibody or HIV or a vaccine or major trauma. It lowers your immune system and voila, reactivation. So that's my only French word I have. Uh, voila, Jean Lambert, okay? So my, my colleague, uh, so Christian Perron. But anyway, so I think that's what happens. I think it's a balance between infections and immunity. So that is the similarity between HIV as well. So I think if you look at HIV, so there are similarities with other infections. And rather than blaming the vaccines, I think it's the I think vaccines are critical. I love vaccines, so we shouldn't be not giving vaccines, but can vaccines catalyze kind of a aberrant immunological response that reactivates an underlying infection? I think so. So I think we'll finish now and move on. Thank you. <laughs>